Uh, I've been asked to talk to you today uh, on some of the challenges that I personally see uh, are facing the mineral exploration industry going forward. And I'd like to focus on just a few uh, key points. Uh, one is to put the premise out there that I think that there's a misalignment between the current mineral industry practice and the future material and resource needs of society. Uh, and I think that, that what, what it is is that it's going to drive a change in how the mineral industry does their exploration from looking at long, longer life but increasingly lower grade and high energy consumption deposits to uh, seeking higher quality deposits, basically higher extractable uh, metal per unit rock deposits. And uh, there's a couple of fundamental shifts that that will require the industry to take in how they go about their exploration targeting. And I'll focus on one of them, and that is trying to detect the larger scale footprints of mineral systems as we move increasingly into challenging uh, uh, areas for exploration that are essentially under some degree of cover, rendering deposits blind to previous exploration technology. So the graph that I have up here uh, is showing data from Australia, showing the trend in greenfields versus brownfields exploration. But if you actually look at the slide, you can see that the red line uh, is not just brownfields, it's actually the on the production lease or on existing deposits. And uh, so that green line, which shows the decreasing trend in the uh, greenfields exploration spend, is actually even worse than it's shown because some of that is actually brownfields exploration. In fact, a lot of it is actually brownfields exploration. Uh, make no mistake that in this last boom we've had, it's been a production boom, not a discovery boom. And essentially it means we're just running towards the wall faster. Uh, another critical point that I think a lot of the mining industry um, acknowledges but isn't knowing how to deal with yet is that society is actually redefining what ore or what will be considered ore in the future. And if, if you look at uh, the types of deposits we're, we're uh, moving towards now, a lot of focus on these big, um, long life, uh, but lower grade deposits. It's an incredibly energy intensive business. You know, the, the numbers of um, uh, that you hear bandied around are that between you know two and six percent of the world's electricity goes into crushing rock. I do know that within Australia, the amount of energy that goes into crushing rock in the mining industry is equivalent to the entire residential sector of the country of over 20 million people. So energy intensive business, and we're moving into an energy constrained future. So that means that we're gonna get a couple, well, a triple whammy really. Uh, a, we're gonna be using more energy to mine our deposits. B, the energy is gonna cost more. Uh, I, I know that my electricity bill is going up. And uh, three, we're actually moving to uh, legislation uh, against energy use. In, in, in essence, in Australia, we have a carbon tax coming in. So you're going to have all of these factors that are going to actually redefine what is economic. And there'll be a, a, a need to seek higher quality deposits. And a lot of those are going to be founded by opening up new mineral districts in areas blind to previous exploration technology. So we want to open up new mineral camps. So I just want to illustrate the challenge uh, by looking at uh, uh, the change that the petroleum industry had made, because they made this shift decades ago, and really it's our turn in the minerals industry to do so. So uh, I've got a slide here that shows production. This is all from National Geographic, and uh, it uh, shows the production uh, of oil in the Gulf Coast in 1961. Now, subsequent to this, of course, in the early 70s, there's the oil crisis, the uh, uh, formation of OPEC, uh, big supply risk, driving innovation into how are we going to secure uh, oil reserves into the future. The next slide here shows what happened after 40 years of innovation. And in doing this, in making this shift, the petroleum industry didn't just uh, say, oh, we've got to drill offshore. They actually, if you talk to the petroleum geologists, the actual concept that there could be large oil deposits in the deep water basins 
never mind the fact that they're some of the largest ones, was a really foreign concept to most of the industry. So there was actually conceptual changes that had to happen that then drove the, te the re required technology changes to image these, uh, the, these uh, rock volumes uh, underwater, to actually drill and test them and then to produce from them. And really, you could look at that slide and say, well, that's the challenge for the minerals industry in the future in going under challenging cover. And uh, so if you look at the response of our industry to that challenge, it's generally been around trying to, deter, trying to uh, develop a better detection technology. Uh, so how do we drill deeper, cheaper, faster, more accurately? Uh, how do we get more information out of the hole? Uh, and all of that is great stuff, and it really uh, is required. Uh, but there is a challenge that we're missing here, and that is, if you look at this graph here, I, I have uh, the relative inputs of predictive technology versus detection technology uh, at, at the broad regional scale down to the prospect scale. And the detection technology that we're employing is very useful in, in, in near mine and brownfields exploration, but it's challenged uh, in areas of, of regional extent. So the, the, the reality is, is that at the Kraton scale or even the belt scale, there is no detection technology that can tell you where the next mineral camp is. And the problem is, is that the big decision is where is the camp? Where is the area where I'm going to go put together a coherent package of land, do systematic but expensive exploration? And as we go undercover, that, that, that uh, crossover in, 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 in cost versus flexibility is going to be even more dramatic. So it's this decision that, that turns the exploration managers into chain smokers, essentially, uh, at the camp scale. Uh, so we really need to focus on what can we do to detect the, the edges of camps, the new mineral districts, and particularly in challenging environments. And the key thing we have to focus on is we have to redefine what the footprint of exploration is. So exploration is essentially about trying to understand the footprint of the deposit, and continually our research has been trying to expand that over the last 40 years with our deposit scale studies. And that's all good, but, but the, the, the challenge is, is that it's still looking at the, the, the tens to hundreds to at most thousands of meters around a deposit. And I think our challenge is to really rip ourselves out of that scale, pull up a scale and say, we need to understand the biggest scale footprints of mineral systems. So a couple slides I have here show that. One is Mississippi Valley type deposits uh, in the continental US. And the, the, they all lie along this dolomite front. And really that is the largest scale footprint of this mineral system. So some of these footprints can be continental in scale. So one of the first order decisions is how, how, do I, how do I progressively narrow the volume of rock down? And this is one of the data sets that you'd want. The next slide that I have shows uh, the same type of thinking, but in the depth dimension. And on this slide, you see the seismic uh, reflectors interpreted uh, from seismic. You see a magnetotelluric image, which is the color image, and the gray shapes are the results of uh, inversions of gravity. This is over the Olympic Dam area in Western Australia, which is under 300 meters of cover that is absolutely bare. So a great example of exploration under cover. Yet, is this showing us the footprint of the deposit? So some of these footprints are crustal in scale. So we need these non-traditional data sets to actually see these bigger footprints. One of the challenges with geophysics is that geophysics images the Earth today. So it gives us a snapshot of what the architecture of the Earth might be uh, today. However, a lot of the deposits we're looking for formed well into the past, and we want to know what was the architecture then. And uh, this slide here shows one of the innovative data sets that people are trying to use to image crustal architecture in the past. And uh, on the right-hand side of this slide, you see a map of Neodymium model ages. This is over the Yilgarn Craton in Western Australia. Uh, these are all uh, uh, gold and nickel deposits that have formed at um, uh, around uh, 2.7 to 2.6 billion years ago. 
and the, the image is made from the neodymium model ages of uh, late granites. The way to read this diagram is uh, the hot colors are granites that have melted older crust, the, the hotter the older. Uh, the cool colors are uh, granites that have melted crust just a few tens of million years older than the granites themselves. The key thing to note is the gradient in the middle. And uh, uh, that gradient is interpreted as being the, the, the paleo margin of the Yilgarn Craton at around the 2.7 billion year mark. And it's interesting to note that all of the nickel systems and a lot of the gold systems are actually concentrating along that fatal flaw in the lithosphere at that time. So again, it's just some examples of some of these non-traditional data sets that, we're, that we could look at to try to see the largest scale footprint of the mineral system. So in conclusion, um, as I said, I, I think that the, the, our current practice of how we go about uh, exploration targeting is, uh, is misaligned with the future material and resource needs of society and that the industry would be forced to undergo a rev revolutionary shift away from seeking large, low-grade resources to focus on seeking high-quality grassroots discoveries. And this will require innovations in understanding the mineral systems rather than the analog deposit models, looking at the fact that the, the deposits are the focus of mass and energy flux through the lithosphere on a very large scale and leave very large footprints. The development of technology packages to effectively explore uh, for these uh, larger scale footprints, and then also to train the next generation of geoscientists to actually employ these. Thank you very much.